A far more popular objection to dualism regards the empirically well-established correlations between mental states and brain states. The thought is that if the mind is a separate substance from the body, then, for example, brain damage shouldn't have any effect on the operations of the mind, and yet clearly the capabilities of the mind can be affected by brain damage. The most widely discussed example of this is Phineas Gage. Gage was an American railroad worker who was the survivor of an accident in which a large iron rod was driven completely through his head, destroying much of his brain's left frontal lobe. The accident cost Gage one of his eyes, but more importantly, it radically altered his personality. Whereas he had once been regarded as a decent hard-working man, after the accident, he became vulgar and selfish. The objection asserts that if the mind and brain are so profoundly linked, then the mind cannot be an immaterial substance distinct from the body. As Antonio Damasio puts it, while other cases of neurological damage that occurred at the time revealed that the brain was the foundation for language perception and motor function and generally provided more conclusive details, Gage's story hinted at an amazing fact. Somehow, there were systems in the human brain dedicated more to reasoning than to anything else, and in particular, to the personal and social dimensions of reasoning. Gage's example indicated that something in the brain was concerned specifically with unique human properties. John Searle adds, According to substance dualism, our brains and bodies are not really conscious. Your body is just an unconscious machine, like your car or your television set. Given what we know about how the world works, it is hard to take substance dualism seriously as a scientific hypothesis. We know that in humans, consciousness cannot exist at all without certain sorts of physical processes going on in the brain. And Jose Musacino gives the most detailed explanation of this argument, saying, Today we know that emotions are physical states that process information about the organism in its relation to the environment. Unknown through subjective perspective, all emotional processes are realized in specific neural circuits, which are mediated by changes in neurotransmitters, hormones, and other cellular messengers. The effects of drugs, electrical brain stimulation, in anatomical liaisons, as well as electrophysiological and fMRI studies, clearly indicate that emotions are physical processes taking place in the brain. Now the first point which I want to raise in response to this argument is one which will recur throughout this video, namely that this objection only applies to interactionist varieties of dualism. Interactionist dualism says that the mind and body causally interact with one another. And while most dualists, myself included, absolutely believe that this sort of interaction occurs, the point remains that a substance dualist could believe that the soul is completely dependent upon the body via something like epiphenomenalism or emergent dualism. I'm not interested in defending either of these theories, but the point is just that this is a significant limitation within the argument from psychophysical correlation. It's not an objection to substance dualism as a whole, but rather only to one type of dualism. With that being said, I and most other dualists are interactionists. After all, it does appear rather obvious that our minds do causally affect our bodies. So what can the interactionist dualist say in response to this objection. In the first place, Searle, at least, incorrectly interprets substance dualism as a scientific hypothesis. Substance dualism is first and foremost a metaphysical hypothesis intended to explain various metaphysical data points, which are mostly drawn from a combination of introspection and reasoning about what is required for things like perceptions, knowledge, personal identity, and persistence. Substance dualism is typically presented as a way of making sense of these sorts of philosophical data points rather than as a scientific or neurological hypothesis. 
as Matthew Owen puts it, most dualist philosophers are not dualists because they think dualism is the best theory for explaining neural correlates of consciousness or any other neuroscientific data. Typically, the rationale for dualism is strictly or principally philosophical and not empirical, since the non-physical mind of substance dualism is not presented as a neuroscientific theory by dualists or argued for as if it were, it should not be evaluated principally on how good of a neuroscientific theory it is. In the second place, Searle and Musacchio are stepping beyond what the scientific data reveals when they claim that we know that consciousness cannot exist at all without certain physical processes occurring in the brain. It may be true that certain physical brain processes are required for certain types of conscious experience or for embodied conscious experience, but this leaves open the possibility that one can continue in a disembodied conscious state apart from their body or brain. We have already explored several lines of evidence for this possibility in the video on the modal argument for dualism. In light of this, how can Searle and Musacchio claim to know that consciousness cannot exist at all in the absence of certain brain processes or even in the absence of a brain? Science does not and absolutely cannot establish this. We might more charitably interpret these critics as merely saying that we know that certain types of conscious experience cannot exist apart from certain types of brain processes, or more accurately still, we know that certain types of mental states are predictably correlated with certain brain states. But such a conclusion is perfectly compatible with the truth of substance dualism. Virtually all dualists believe that the body and brain causally interact with one another, so such correlations are perfectly expected given substance dualism. As Andrew Brenner observes, but this way of developing the objection to substance dualism is far too strong, since obviously no substance dualist thinks that our mental states are totally unconnected with what occurs in the brain. Everybody knows that when you are bopped on the head, this will cause a change in your mental state, a loss in consciousness, or at least some pain. Similarly, everyone knows that drugs can modify what happens in the brain and thereby modify our mental states. Substance dualists do not deny these obvious and widely recognized facts. And Matthew Owen adds, from correlation alone, we could not infer that the mental state caused the neural activity, depended on it, was identical to it, or reducible to it. If a physicalist assumed physics is fundamental before mapping the correlation between the mental activity and the corresponding neural activity, she would likely conclude that the correlation implies that the mental activity depends on the neural activity. She would be justified in doing so, to the degree that her assumption was well justified, but she would not be arriving at this conclusion merely on the basis of the correlation. Rather, she would be justifiably arriving at the conclusion on the basis of the correlation coupled with her pre-experimental assumption. Similarly, a dualist could justifiably conclude that immaterial minds stood in some type of causal relation with the neural correlates if she justifiably assumed that their mental states are not reducible to physical states. In short, correlations don't entail causation, dependency, identity, or reducibility. Further philosophical argumentation beyond the empirical data of neural correlates of consciousness is required to arrive at a justified conclusion about the nature of the mind. Some materialists, such as J.J.C. Smart, Christopher Hill, Ned Block, and Robert Stallnacker, acknowledge that correlation between mental states and brain states is insufficient to establish that the mental is itself physical or causally dependent upon physical processes. However, they have argued that the empirical data of psychophysical correlation can be paired with an appeal to parsimony to generate an argument in favor of materialism, the argument would go something like this. 
given that we know that mental states are correlated with physical states, and given that we want as simple an ontology as possible, it is simplest to just identify mental states with the physical states with which they are correlated. As Smart puts it, Why do I wish to resist this suggestion? Mainly because of Occam's razor. It seems to me that science is increasingly giving us a viewpoint whereby organisms are able to be seen as physiochemical mechanisms. It seems that one day, even the behavior of man himself will one day be explicable in mechanistic terms. There does seem to be, so far as science is concerned, nothing in the world but increasingly complex arrangements of physical constituents, all except for in one place, in consciousness. So sensations, states of consciousness, do seem to be the one sort of thing left outside of a physicalist picture, and so for various reasons, I just cannot believe this to be so, that everything should be explicable in terms of physics, except the occurrence of sensations, seems to me frankly unbelievable. Two points should be raised in response to this version of the argument from psychophysical correlation. In the first place, to the extent that this is a successful argument against substance dualism at all, it applies regardless of the empirical data. In other words, it's not actually necessary to make any appeal to the empirically detected correlations between mental states and brain states in order to argue that physicalism is a simpler hypothesis. This can be seen just by considering that physicalism is only committed to the existence of the material body, whereas the dualist is committed to the existence of both the material body and the immaterial mind. So physicalism has a parsimony advantage over dualism regardless of the empirical data. In short, then, this is not really an extension of the argument from psychophysical correlation at all. It is a wholly different argument based purely on theoretical concerns pertaining to the explanatory simplicity of physicalism. But as a second point, while it is true that physicalism has a parsimony advantage over dualism, parsimony is not a decisive indicator of truth all by itself. Simpler hypotheses are only more likely to be true if all other things stand equal between competing hypotheses. But the substance dualist need not and should not agree that all other things stand equal between dualism and physicalism. Specifically, the powerful arguments for the truth of dualism, which we have already considered in this series, weigh strongly in favor of dualism over physicalism. As long as these arguments stand, the relative simplicity of physicalism over dualism is not a sufficient reason to believe that physicalism is true. As Matthew Owen concludes, one weakness of the simplicity argument is that it rests upon one, and only one, theoretical virtue. Simplicity is significant, but it's not the only theoretical virtue. There are additional theoretical virtues to consider, such as explanatory power, explanatory scope, fertility, internal coherence, and consistency with widely accepted theories and background knowledge. If identity theory is the simplest theory, that's a significant point in its favor. However, by itself, simplicity is not conclusive. If simplicity itself were conclusive, then we should go with a view like solipsism and conclude that there is just one mind that exists. It's hard to think of a simpler theory, but given that there is more to consider than simplicity, we need not commit ourselves to solipsism simply because it is simple. Likewise, simplicity itself is not enough to establish that dualism is false and the identity theory is true. Unless, of course, all else is equal and the identity theory is on par with dualism on every other score. If that's the case, then simplicity can act as an epistemic tiebreaker, tipping the balance in favor of the simplest view. In other words, the simplicity argument requires another premise affirming the conditional mentioned in premise 1, which reads, all else being equal, 
the simplest explanation of a data set is the best explanation. However, this additional premise is not obviously true, but questionable given the apparent differences between consciousness and neural correlates, and I think there are good arguments offered by leading philosophers for dualism. As a final point, Andrew Brenner convincingly argues that the argument from psychophysical correlation is completely reversible. He says, A better way to put the objection to substance dualism is that the observed correlations between mental states and brain states are more surprising on the assumption that substance dualism is true than on the assumption that substance dualism is false. However, an analogous objection can be made against the view that we are composite physical objects. If we are composite physical objects, then our properties are robustly correlated with the properties of our parts. If we are composite physical objects, then our mental states are closely correlated with the properties and relations exhibited by the parts of our brains. These correlations should surprise us, just as the correlations between the properties of immaterial souls and the properties of brains should surprise us. If, by contrast, only the parts exist, and they fail to compose a composite physical person, then it would not be surprising that the mental properties would be systematically correlated with the properties of the parts. In this case, the mental properties would be properties of the parts, in which case properties of the parts would simply be correlated with the properties of the parts, which is hardly surprising. By contrast, if the parts compose a composite physical person, then we should not expect the mental properties of the composite physical person to correlate so systematically with the properties of the parts. The view that we are composite physical persons is compatible with those correlations, but it does not predict them. And the reason it does not predict them is the same reason why substance dualism does not predict the systematic correlations between the properties of souls and the properties of brains. Composite physical persons are not numerically identical with their parts, and so we lack any antecedent reason to think that their properties would be so systematically correlated with the properties of those parts. So to summarize this section, the argument from psychophysical correlation fails for at least five reasons. First, it is only an objection to one type of dualism. Second, it incorrectly interprets substance dualism as a scientific hypothesis intended to explain the empirical data gathered from neuroscience. Third, it makes an unjustified inference from mental states being correlated with brain states to mental states being identical with, caused by, or dependent on brain states. Fourth, the attempt to couch the argument as an inference to the best explanation suffers from only considering a single theoretical virtue, and also, I have argued, it is really a complete departure from the argument from psychophysical correlation. Fifth and finally, the argument is completely reversible.